It is great to be with you. It's always a privilege to open the Bible, to speak from the Word of God. We've already heard in our worship and from what Esther was showing us, lots about Jesus. And um, I want to help it make sense for you this morning. That's the plan. That's always what we want to do is, is come and listen to the Word of God and understand what it is saying to us. Um, we are going to have a little think back. Almost a year ago, I want you to think back, if you can, to the time when there was the coronation of King Charles. It wasn't even a year ago. It feels like a long time ago, right? But almost a year ago, um, there's been lots about the royal family recently, hasn't there? But I want you to think back particularly about this moment. Do you know, it took nearly two hours for them to travel only 1.3 miles through London. That is, I mean, London traffic is normally bad, right? But like, but that is particularly, uh, particularly bad. And there was just rank upon rank of, of armed services and nobility and horses. And then you've got this golden carriage. I think there should be a picture on the screen of this. Um, you've got the golden carriage where the king or the queen and other instances comes through. And my wife, Jo, was there. Some of you will know her. She's a, she's a, a great royal fan. She was, in fact... I can't remember which flag it was she was under, but she was somewhere on the mall waving her, her little flag. Um, not quite as big as those ones, but yeah, there was a, this whole procession. Now just imagine for a moment, when it comes time for, for William to be crowned king, imagine a similar scenario, and there's this, there's this whole procession, but instead of coming at the back after all of these things in a golden carriage, William is there at the front of this procession, dancing wildly in his pants. Just, I mean, don't imagine it for too long. <laughs> but imagine that moment. It would be, it would be an odd sight, wouldn't it? He's, he's there just dancing wildly, and he's telling everyone and everyone around him who will listen that he's doing it to, to honour God. Can you imagine that? I find it, I find it hard to imagine that. If I'm honest, I think that would be a strange thing to see. It would be a strange and even potentially dangerous political move, wouldn't it? For the new king of a nation to go, guys, I've got a great idea. Can you imagine the advisors actually signing off on that? I can't. You've got, instead, kind of coming behind the representation of all the military might of the country, there he is at the front, just dancing in his boxes. I'd imagine he'd have, he'd have good boxes, but I don't know. Now, some of you I know are already way ahead of me. You know where I'm going in the Bible because you know there's a story about this kind of thing. Um, but some of you are also wondering, because maybe you're new to church, why has there already been so much talk about underwear? This is weird. And I get that. It's okay. We're going to make sense of all of this. But there is, there is almost this exact story that happens in a passage in the Bible. We're going to look today at Samuel chapter, uh, 2 Samuel sorry, chapter 6, and it's in the Old Testament. So that's the part of the Bible before Jesus has rocked up on the scene, before he's come to earth. Um, and you can Google it if you want to. You might have a Bible app, but it is going to be on the screen as well. I'm going, to, I'm going to read it. But there's this kind of, there's a nod to this idea in the actual coronation of a king or queen in England. If you remember it well, you'll notice there was a moment when he actually, King Charles strips off all of the kind of outer robes and everything else like that. And he's just got this, this linen kind of shirt on. And we're going to look at the, the original, the OG of this kind of moment, King David. Okay, so we're going to 2 Samuel chapter 6. I would encourage you to, to get these things up in front of you. So it will be on the screen, but if you've got it in front of you, it will do you good for a start to, to know that you've got a Bible on your phone. Some of you might even have one of those old school paper Bibles. I think they're still a thing. I always try and bring mine. It does me good because then it means it's open in front of me. And then it means that sometime in the week, if I happen to open my Bible, it might just fall open in exactly the same place that I was thinking about on Sunday. It'll do you good. Um, and also it allows you to check that I'm actually telling you the truth. And then what I'm saying is actually there. So why not get it up in front of you? We're going we're gonna to kind of walk through this passage this morning. And the plan is to see that actually prayer is a central thing and an essential thing to David's life and leadership. And then we're going to look at kind of what that might mean for you and for me. And if nothing else, I'm going to do a little, a little magic trick for you. I know. Not solely for you youth lot up there, but... I mean, you need to be able to see this. There's going to be actual fire. I know, exciting times. So the context here in this passage is that the Ark of the Covenant, okay, which is this kind of golden box, which, which is the very presence of God himself, this golden chest, is dwelling on the earth. And it's been captured by the enemies for quite some time. The Philistines, they've taken it, and it was kind of just left in a field. Then it's been won back by Israel. And now David has become king after this other guy called Saul has died. And he's like, 
we need to we need to do something about this. And so he decides it's time for the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, to come and find its new home in Jerusalem. Okay, it's one of the first things he does as the new king, and it's the, kind of this act that makes Jerusalem that that holy city, it's the place of the presence of God. Now, it might not surprise you if you were here last week to to know that I've also been thinking about what kind of things you might do as a new leader. Um, Because we shared last week that um, Chris and I are going to be leading together over this next year. And then kind of this time next year, I'll be senior leader in Life Church Southampton. So I've been thinking a lot about that kind of stuff. Like, what are the things you do? I hasten to add, I know some of you have gone there already. I'm not going to dance in my pants. Strictly forbidden by my wife um, and the laws of this country. But there's a few things I want you to think about. I was led to this passage, particularly as we were talking about this and thinking about this in 2 Samuel in chapter 6. And there's a few things that's important for you to understand. Chris is not like Saul. So if you know the story of Saul and David, Saul runs around chasing after King David, trying to kill him for quite some time. That's not been happening. Chris and I are great friends. We get on really well. Um, And Chris is nothing like Saul. In fact, he's not a terrible person or a terrible leader, but Saul was. Um, And so... Like I say, I'm not going to dance in my pants either, but there are things for us to learn here about what we must prioritize. Maybe even a bit about what it's going to be like if, if I am leading and how I intend to lead and what our prayer life looks like for us as a church. So let's read this together and we'll take a walk through and stop at various points as we go. So it says in verse 1 of chapter 6, David again brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000. He and all his men went to Bala in Judah to bring up there to bring up from there, sorry, the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. That's these two kind of angelic figures on the top of this big golden box, and there is the very presence of God himself. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the Ark of God on it. And Ahio was walking in front of it. David and all Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord with castanets, harps, lyres, timbrels, sistrums, and cymbals. Let's just pause here for a moment. You see, David's plan is to put God right at the heart of everything he does as the new king of Israel. So by transporting the ark, the very presence of God, right into the heart of Jerusalem, this this new capital city, David is making a point of the presence of God. He wants to have a place where people can come and worship him, where they can come and pray. And he, he properly goes to town on this procession. Like he goes all out, all the able young men, 30,000. He gets everyone in on this. You see, God has been faithful to his promise to be with his people while they honor him. And since, since the days of Moses and now David is kind of reestablishing this central place, God keep, continues to kind of just be forgotten by the people and then remembered by the people. And it goes badly for them and then it goes well when they remember him. David is like, if there's one thing we need to do, we have to remember the presence of God and establish in the central place. And he does this with a brand new car. Did you notice that in verse 3? You see, everyone is giving it plenty of effort. It says that they were dancing with all their might. I don't know if I've ever danced with all my might. I'm not sure anyone wants to know what that looks like. I don't know if you've ever done that. But I don't know. I don't quite even know what dancing... I sing with all my might in the car on my own quite a bit. But dancing, I'm I'm not sure. But they are properly going for it. But what happens next is the ultimate mood killer to what should have been a great celebration. Let's read in verse 6. It says, When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore God struck him down, and he died there beside the ark of God. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah, and to this day that place is called Perez Uzzah which kind of means basically like the outbreak against Uzzah. So what, what is going on here? This seem, doesn't this seem like a bit of an overreaction from God? Right, like they're, they're, they're trundling along. He's built a new cart for this thing, and then like one of the oxen stumbles. It's going to fall off. Uzzah saves the day and then dies. What is going on here? We well, see, in some ways, it actually comes back to this new cart that they have built for this moment. Because God has given some really pretty specific instructions about how this ark, how he should be moved around, about what he wants them to do with 
him. And actually, here, David and everybody else has completely disregarded the ways that God has said, no, this is how it should be. And Uzzah does the same. It seems, doesn't it, like a sensible thing for Uzzah to do. But God has specifically told them previously that no one can touch this holy thing. Otherwise, they will die. Like he's, he's spelt it out really, really clear for them. Now, Uzzah has got pretty used to the Ark of the Covenant, this, this presence of God being in dad's house. That's where it's come from, Abinadab, and Uzzah is a son of Abinadab. So he's kind of got used to just being around it. Maybe he's got a bit over familiar even with the presence of God, just part of the furniture, probably quite literally. And so he's used to it. And then he, one of the other things he's done is he's decided that Nacon, whoever he is, his threshing floor, which is also in the Bible, like it's often, a threshing floor is often used as a place of judgment. It's that kind of idea. He's decided that if the Ark of the Covenant was to fall onto the threshing floor, that that, that floor, Nacon's place, is less holy than his hand. Hasn't he? He's made that decision. If it was going to fall off, he's like, well, I'm better than that. And he said, I can, I can deal with this. I can sort it out. He's decided that he needs to take action before God takes action. Even he can see something about to go wrong. You can, you can imagine it in slow motion, can't you? The oxen stumbles on a rock. The knee goes down. Uzzah looks around, open mouth, and the, the, the cart just jumps. It starts to slide, and Uzzah reaches out his hand. You can, you can make sense of it. But he's decided, I'm going to do something before God does. He just basically reckons he can do better than God. He knows better. See, the holy presence of God is not something that we can play around with. And I told you, it's, it's a bit of a mood killer. In this moment, it's an other killer as well. But you see, God is holy. He is dazzling, holy, fierce light. It's a little bit, a little bit, not holy, a little bit like this candle. Now, this is, my, uh, this is my little attempt at representation of God, which in a room full of bright lights doesn't work particularly well. But you can, you can get the idea, right? Everyone can see the candle. So imagine for a moment that this is God, just infinitely bigger, infinitely hotter, fiercer, wilder, holier than this. But this, this light provides light, it provides life to everything around it. And we, we are not holy. Here we are. You can tell I used to be a primary school teacher. Look at that cutting. Great skills. This is us. And we are not holy. In fact, all of us, this is what the Bible teaches us, that all of us have said and thought and done things that just cause us to fall short of the perfection and holiness of God. We are not perfect. In fact, we fall way short. We've not actually done all the things that God tells us we should do, let alone doing all the stuff that he tells us we shouldn't do. And so it's bad news for us. The Bible's word for it is sin. And like Uzzah, we kind of decide, actually, I know better than God. I do things all my own way. And so it causes this separation from us and God because I can't possibly approach, can I? Because I am other than him. He is other than me. He is so much more than I could ever possibly cope with. You see, that's why God has contained himself to this finite presence of the ark. It's out of mercy to, to the people of God that he said, I am going to keep myself here. Because if I was to break out, which what, the outbreak language throughout 2 Samuel 6 is, is everywhere. If I was to break out amongst you, you would stand no chance. So how is it then that we come on a Sunday morning and say, come, Lord Jesus, come, Holy Spirit. And we're not standing, trembling, thinking, who's going to die today? That's how it should be. Because he is holy. God has always wanted to be with his people. That's why he put these, these rules in place that said, you, you can approach me, but it has to be this way. Because I want to be with you, but I am holy and you are not. You see, the problem of our sin is that it keeps us away from him. We, can't, we cannot get close. You see, God in his holiness 
and us in our sin leads to moments like Uzzah, where he just gets too close and he just, he just touches it with his hand. <sighs> There's always a moment of panic inside me every time. I've done it before and I know it's going to be okay. <laughs> but there's the reality to that moment. You see, we cannot live with God. We, he is holy. He is other than us. But then we can't live without him because he's the light and life of all things. He's the source of every good thing that comes. And before you start maybe worrying, maybe just feeling like, am I getting a bit hot under the collar? Oh. There is good news. And I'll share it with you shortly. But for now, let's just continue with David because we're getting to his pants dance. And I know that's what you're all here for. Verse 9. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? See, he knew what he was like. Maybe, maybe this morning you kind of just, even as we've been singing these and as you're listening to what I've just said, you're kind of like, oh man, I know what I'm like. How could the ark of the Lord, how can the presence of God ever come to someone like me? Verse 10, he was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months, and the Lord blessed him and his entire household. So David cancels the party pretty quickly, which makes sense. I mean, a guy's just died. Like, guys, cancel everything. I'm, I'm afraid and I'm angry. So he just avoids God. And then he realizes that if Uzzah is going to die literally just by touching this thing, how on earth am I going to bring it into my, like, into my city? How are we going to live with, with God if he does stuff like this? Have you ever felt like that? See, if God is holy and I can't come near him if I'm not perfect, then I have no chance. And neither do you. None of us do. But then something interesting happens. You see, the house that he leaves the ark at belongs, the ark, sorry, he's Obed-Edom. And he's a Levite. Okay, so he's a, he's a priest. He's one of the people who God has said previously, these are the kind of guys, I want them to carry my ark. They're the ones who I've said, yep, that's how we're going to do it. So the tribe of Israel, who are the ones that, that God had commanded could carry the ark, David happens to leave the, the ark there. And God blesses Obed-Edom and his family. Like, their crops grow, their animals all have babies. Everything goes wonderfully well in the house of Obed-Edom. Have you ever felt like David felt with God? Like, there's just stuff about God, maybe stuff in the Bible that you just can't get your head around. We're like, I, j I, I think you're great, but I wish you wouldn't say that. Like, I love church, but... There's bits in this little passage where it makes it very difficult for me to live in the kind of world we live in today. Maybe there's stuff about the church or kind of even other Christians that just kind of makes you angry and you're like, well, oh, it's just better that I have nothing to do with it. But then there's also something in you that just can't stay away. There's something that makes you just drawn back and that is kind of what is going on with David here. He looks at the house of Obed-Edom and he's like, everything is going well with him. That, that, that could be me. Christians, there is something about you that draws people to God. Not because necessarily everything is great in your life, but because there's something, like most of you, have just been looking at this rather than me for quite some time. Because it draws you in, right? It's the same with God. You can't help but realize the source of any actual good thing is him. It's almost like a moth to a flame. You are drawn back to God and David realizes the same thing. You see, the presence of God is everything. And once you've tasted of that, nothing else satisfies. And that's where David finds himself. So verse 12. Now King David was told, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God, because of the presence of God. So David went up to bring the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. So we're back where we start. David's like, right, we're going to do it. And it's with rejoicing. So this time, though, David does it God's way rather than his way. The last time around, he thought God wanted this big show and a new car and all shiny and everything else. But God is never interested in the big show. You know that. He's always interested in, are you, are you, are you just like, is your heart with me? He listens to the, to the way that I'm saying, look, this is, this is good for you. That's when it all changes for David, and in fact, the whole nation, they do it God's way. 
So verse 13, when those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps and got very far, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf, wearing a linen ephod, which is like a priest's underpants, basically. It's the stuff that went under. There was no robes or anything like that. It was, and it didn't leave a lot to the imagination. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. While he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. So everyone is expecting the golden carriage. They would actually be expecting David to be brought in on a palanquin, which is a word I learned yesterday, or a litter, which is that like bed on poles. You know the ones I mean? Like kind of people get carried around on them. That's what should have happened. He should be carried in by a load of strong men and like he's just reclining there, like waving to his people. But David has been humbled. And so he chooses then to humble himself before God and before the people even. And rather than being carried in like a king, he takes the low place of a servant. Because he knows he is a servant of the king of kings. He knows it's not about him. In fact, it is the ark that is carried like that. Did you notice that? So it's God that is carried on these poles because he is the true king. He is the only one worthy. And for us, for me, here at Life Church, if, if this transition of leadership from Chris to me looks anything like me being high and lifted up and elevated to some kind of position, we have missed the point. And you need to call it out whenever you see it. Because Jesus Christ is the only one who takes the high place and the highest place. And for you, if, you're, if your leadership may be in your family or in your marriage or in your workplace or, or anywhere else that God has called you to, to bring leadership or authority or you have some sense of power, if you are the one being lifted up, that is not God's way. And it never has been. We honor those who lead us. That's a right and good thing. But true leadership is servanthood. And the one we serve has to be the source of everything. It has to be God himself. You see, in both attempts to bring the ark into Jerusalem, something dies en route. The first journey starts with this big celebration and it ends in others', others death and fear that spreads throughout. The second journey starts with the death of a sacrifice and a sacrifice according to the way that God has intended it to be and it ends in blessing. David's reign is unparalleled in the kings of Israel because of this, because he puts God in the right place. See, David's humility before God and before his people has the whole aim of putting God at, at this kind of central place of, of prayer, of coming to him, talking with him, learning what it is that he's saying, what it is that he's doing. It's in the very heart of the city, and it has to be the same for us here at Life Church. We have to be all about the presence of God. And in fact, even in our own lives, if Jesus isn't the priority, you're missing the main event. You're missing the main thing. And God is still holy and deserves all of our worship. You see, maybe in your life you can put on a great show. Maybe even on a Sunday morning, you can put on a great show and, and look like you've got it all together and like God's the main thing. But underneath it all, you know that you stand no chance in the presence of a holy God. So what hope is there? I've got a bull behind. No, we don't need to start sacrificing bulls. That's not the hope. That is not what we have to do. But there's a scene that plays out, and Esther talked about it earlier, the Sunday before Easter Sunday, which is where we are today, where Jesus also enters Jerusalem with much celebration. There are loads of parallels between these scenes. It's called Palm Sunday. We see it in the four gospel accounts. And they're in, they're in the New Testament. That's the part where Jesus does come on the scene and we see him starting to fulfill a load of stuff that we've seen in the Old Testament. And you're going, I'm sure I've seen that somewhere before. And Jesus starts doing all this stuff. He comes into Jerusalem. He's riding on a donkey. This is a humble animal. He is still the king of kings and he has come riding on a donkey. He has humbled himself. 
The people welcome him, shouting, Hosanna to the son of, oh, David. They get it. They've seen this before. They weren't there, but they've, they, they know what's going on. Because in both David and in Jesus, they're looking for the one. They're looking for the Messiah. They're looking for the one who's going to come and save them. That's why they shout, Hosanna, save us, son of David. We've seen a king like you before. And David came with the presence of God and then he brought peace to the nation because they smashed everybody around them. That's what they want in Jesus. They spread their cloaks and the palm branches on the road before him. They are welcoming him as, as a king who's come to save them. But you can see these parallels with 2 Samuel 6, right? You're, you're way ahead of me, I'm sure. But you see, Jesus demonstrates what this humble leadership looks like even more than David does. See, the events of this next week, which we're going to explore as a church as we pray together this week, get a prayer guide. It will lead you through. We've got the last words of Jesus, basically, and it leads you through this. It will do you good. We're going to explore that. But Jesus shows us what a perfect and humble king looks like. He's come to establish the presence of God right in the heart of the city of Jerusalem, but in a different way. Right in the heart of the people. In fact, right in the heart of all humans everywhere who will look at him for who he truly is. You see, Jesus understands the problems that we face as human beings. He knows that we are those sin-soaked people who as, it, as soon as we get near the holiness of God, it's game over. He gets it. He knows that. And so instead of us coming to him, he comes to us. He brings the light and life that has lit the sky for all eternity, he comes to earth as a baby and brings his presence to us. He lives this life without sin. He maintains perfect holiness. He can talk with his father, be with him in perfect union because he has never sinned. He can approach. He can go into the, into the light because he is perfect. But then the darkness of this world the stuff that's in me and you and in every human that has ever been and ever will be, he takes it into himself. And so seemingly, as the light of the world hangs on that cross, the light is snuffed out. It's gone. Game over. See, like David before him, he's humbled himself before the people and before God. Like David before him, he chose to honor God alone, to put the relationship with the almighty God of heaven as the first thing before all other things. You see, David danced with hardly anything on and Jesus hung naked on a cross. The similarity and yet the stark differences are not incidental or accidental. Jesus is the better king of the people of God. He's humbled even then to the point of death. He took our sin-soaked lives, the right judgment that should be ours, and he took it upon himself. See, because he was the very light of the world, the darkness couldn't overcome him. So while there was a moment when it seemed like everything was snuffed out, and if I could have said this bit quicker, I'd just lit the smoke and it would have relit and it would have been really cool, but I had stuff to say. But there's a moment, isn't there, which we celebrate next Sunday where Jesus comes back to life. How underwhelming was that? But that moment changed everything because he doesn't stay dead. Because he is the light of the world. The darkness has not overcome him, but he has buried the darkness. He has taken all of the stuff that you and I deserve not to be able to approach God with. And he goes, you can come. You can come through me. It is the best news in all history. But not just that. He then comes and he goes, you can have my light. You can have my light. You can have my light. He puts his light inside each and every one who would look at him for who he truly is. For all who would put their trust in him for all that he has done on our behalf, he invites us to be in him. And if he is God, then we can come to God, right? Because if we're in him, we are covered. It doesn't mean all of our sin doesn't affect us. It doesn't mean it doesn't have consequences in our lives, but it does mean that we can come before him. And it is good news. Will you do it today? If you've never put your trust in Jesus, this is a day for you to do that. And then next week, you celebrate with the rest of us that you have been raised to new life with Jesus Christ, that the light's been turned on again. 
You see, for both David and for Jesus, it was all about the very presence of God being at the very center. In both David and Jesus, the people wanted and expected a king who was going to come with strategy and military might and political power. Maybe even in the church today, we're hoping for the same thing. We're looking for someone who's going to come and, and just do all the things that we are hoping for. Maybe you're even thinking, well, I can't wait till Sai takes over because he's going to do everything I want. If you're looking for power and strategy and those sorts of things, this isn't that place. I'm not that guy. We are a people of the presence. We're a people of prayer. It is not about programs and productivity, but the presence. See, the strategy, if you want to know it, like, like David, like Jesus, it's, it's the presence of God amongst us. I have nothing else to offer you. But in that, I had everything. And so do you. It is all about Jesus. We come to him, we humble ourselves before him like David. We come and we pray and we make it all about him. We do things his way. And you see, for David, that meant the scorn of Michal, his wife. She hated him for what he did. If you, if you read on in this, you can, you can see she is, she is not happy. And she tells him so in quite sarcastic language. And then David's response to her is this. It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people, Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. David doesn't give a monkey's what Michal, his wife, thinks of what he's doing because he's doing it before the Lord. There are probably going to be moments when all of us will look at some of what we do Maybe some of what we do as a church and go, oh, we should be doing this, we should be doing that. Well, another week of prayer, are you kidding me? I'm busy. If we do not prioritize the presence of God in our lives, we are missing the way that God has intended it for it to be. The, the temptation in our lives is huge to look good before our world. Right? David was the king of a nation. If there was anyone he needed to look good before, it was all these people that he's just gathered. He sets up one celebration and a guy dies. And then the next one, he's dancing in his pants. It's not, it's not a great look, is it, for a new king? But what does it look like in your world? In front of your friends, in front of your family, in front of your boss? How, how are you leading yourself in your life? I don't know who it is in your life that holds sway over you for wanting to put on a good show for wanting to look like you've got it all together, look good. But for David, he killed that hold over him right from the very off and said, this is about before the Lord. Jesus said before his death, Father, if there's any other way to let this cup, this, this moment on the cross pass from me, please, but your will, not mine. He died to himself and then died on our behalf. You see, if you are looking for the strategy to make it, the way of Jesus is to humble yourself before God, to prioritize his presence and to pray, to learn who he is. And if you've never had a moment where you have acknowledged that you have, you have no way of, of coming into the presence of God, if you've never recognized your own sin, the things that cause you to fall short of the glory of God, then you can do that today. You can do that in this moment and it will change all eternity for you. Today is a great day to accept the free gift that Jesus gives you. He wraps you up in himself and so you can approach the throne of grace with confidence. His perfect light and life in place of your sin-soaked rejection of God. So you can come before him from today onwards. It's not just a then thing, it's a now thing. You can know his presence. You can know his presence in you that makes you holy and changes your world around you. No more fear, no more shame, no more guilt, no more condemnation, no more just feeling like, oh, I 
don't know if I've done enough. Because it's a free gift from him. That life can be yours by trusting in Jesus today. And maybe if you're, if you're part of the church and you've kind of fallen into the pattern of, of leading or just simply living as though anyone's opinion, including your own, matters more than what God says about you, today is another day for us to come and humble ourselves before him. No one is allowed to strip down to their pants. Let's just make that very clear. Please don't do that. But what we do is we strip off all the pretense before him. All the layers of stuff that we put on that make ourselves feel like we should be able to come into the presence of God. We just strip it all off. See, the beauty of it is this. Jesus hung naked on a cross so that you don't have to stand naked and afraid knowing that, oh, what's he going to do to me? Because he's already, he's already taken it all on your behalf. The truth is Jesus clothes you with royal robes. He esteems you. He puts his cloak of righteousness on your shoulders and said, yeah, he's, he's with me. She's with me. He's mine. She's mine. If your trust is in Jesus, whether from 10 seconds ago or 10 weeks ago or 10 years ago, you are clothed in his righteousness. And that never changes. You have put on Christ, as it says in Romans. You're clothed in him. And then it is from that place that we prioritize the presence of God because he is in us and we are in him, in him and he is with us right now in this place. And we pray, God, what is it you're doing? Where do you want me to be? What do you want me to say? See, God has glorious things for, for us to walk in as individuals. So for each of you in this room, God has plans and purposes for you. And together as a church, he has stuff for us. But they start from him not from us, and they're for him, not for us, and they're done through him, not through us. It is all about him. Does the band want to just come up? I'm going to just share this quote with you. By, you'll know uh, a lot of this has kind of come from a book by Tyler Dayton, and I always get the title wrong, Living Like Monks, no, Praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools, get it wrong every time try really hard as well. But he says this, talking about this idea of putting God right at the heart of everything. He says, a yes to this kind of kingdom vision looks less like gritting our teeth and more like a king dancing in a priest's underwear. It looks less like putting our nose to the grindstone and more like Jesus, smiling ear to ear on the back of a donkey half his weight. They're supposed to be ridiculous images. It looks a lot less like intensity and a lot more like joy. Friends, we can't take ourselves too seriously. We have the joy of the Lord in us because his light has shone in our hearts. And so we come to him. If you want a life before God that looks more like joy and dancing in your pants metaphorically, then come to Jesus just as you are, just as you are. And then you take him just as he is, holy and unapproachable in his light and yet made approachable through his death and his resurrection. You can come to him today and we can be a church together that prioritizes the presence above all else. Come into him in prayer. And so we do that as we sing. Why don't we stand together for a moment? I want to pray for us if you if you would say I, have, I, I don't think I've ever had a moment where I would know that if I was in others position and touched the ark if I came that close to God then I would know that I am covered with the blood of Jesus from what he gave in my place this can be your moment right now you can just bring before him everything you know everything you know that would cause you to look at yourself and feel shame and you can bring it before him and say I trust that Jesus has taken that away from me I put my trust in his death and his resurrection I trust that because of him I can approach your holiness right now and I can begin a relationship with my father in heaven 
if you've been if you've been doing things your way if you've been stuck in a place of like I've got to just try harder and do better as a Christian I've got to look like I've got it together because I'm struggling let there be joy that comes now because he's already done it all on your behalf there's nothing you can add to this If you're, if you're stuck because you're just constantly fearful of what others might say about you or think about you, I want to pray freedom over you right now. But it comes from that place of humility. We recognize, Jesus, that you are the King of kings. You're the only one who deserves to be high and lifted up. You're the only one who deserves to have the priority in our lives. And Lord, we are sorry for the times when we make it about us and about a million other things. Jesus, we choose you today. And Lord, as we do, would you come by your holy, holy, holy spirit and remind us that we are yours, that we stand in that place that has been unapproachable for so long. And yet on that day, the temple curtain was torn, the Holy of Holies was shed into the whole world. And right now, by your Holy Spirit, that very presence is here with us. Lord, we believe that you want to do good things amongst us as a church. But Lord, it starts with us coming before you and recognizing you as King. Amen. Amen. Let's sing.